Okay, let's get started. Thank you everyone for coming to the seminar organized by the Water Center. Today is our fourth seminar series. And with us today, we have Dr. Todd Hallahan. So I'm going to introduce him and then he will take over to give his talk for today's seminar. So Dr. Hallahan is a professor and he's an interim department head and his own company, Clyde Miller Chair in Hydrogeology at Oklahoma State University. And he's also the chief technical officer for Estus LLC. Um, Dr. Hallahan's professional interests center in subsurface characterization using electrical hydrogeology and sustainable water supply. He has been an associate editor for Groundwater and he has served as the secretary and treasurer of the US chapter of the International Association of Hydrogeologists. He served as the chair of the Hydrogeology Division and the South Central Section of the Geological Society of America. He was also the National Groundwater Association's 2018 McLean Lecturer and the 2022 American Institute of Hydro Hydrology's CV Thais Award winner. So ladies and gentlemen, with that, I present to you Dr. Tad Hala. And as I understand, my range is from here to here so that that can keep looking at me. So I normally wander around, but I will ping the sides as needed. <laughs> if you see me over there, give me a wave and tell me I should get back into the right domain. Um, as I was introduced there, I'm, I'm a person with a few different hats and uh, uh, I'm the developer of the technology that was the first cowboy technologies company. And so uh, university um, develops technologies and then tries to commercialize them. In academia, that's tricky because if the company fails, well then maybe you're not a good researcher, although a lot of companies fail. Um, if the company does all right, well, maybe you're just trying to make money um, and you're not a serious academic. And if the company does well, well, you're, you're making too much money I'm suspicious about your science now. And it's like, well, wait a minute. If the science is making a lot of money, didn't that mean the science was good? No, it means you're just in for the money. So it's it's a little weird to be an academic who does commercialization because there's sort of a weird reaction to it. Now, if you're running a university and you can get royalties from companies and you can get the science outputted to the public, that's a great thing. Um, so administrators normally like that type of thing of commercialization. Other folks aren't sure what to do with it. And so I've done this for over 20 years now, and I've never found that it got any different. There's a range of responses. Um, and so saying that you're a good or bad professor, if you're commercializing, you'll have some people think it's not a good thing and some people think it's a wonderful thing. So um, it's just the way it works. But if you get any questions about things, essentially it's, I need to have the morals of a kindergartner. So, I shouldn't have my students come and work for my company at low rates that I might pay a student at a university. Um, and I shouldn't use all the university equipment to make money with commercially. And that's the kind of rules that they go with. But I do hire former students in the company. And so there's several people that did degrees with me that my company is now paying full time because they're really good at doing the stuff that our research develops. So, um, but the, the lines are pretty simple morally. It's just that a lot of professors have broken those lines. And so there's a lot of paperwork to do at a university if you decide to do that kind of approach. Uh, but we'll talk more about that approach as we go. Um, so the company is ASTIS. It's housed in Colorado and then um, OSU based in Stillwater, Oklahoma. So I do hydrogeology um, and we're worried about, normally hydrogeology implies you're doing groundwater work. And you might be doing contaminants, you might be doing water supply, but you're working under the ground. And um, late 80s, they did an experiment out in uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. They also did one up in uh, Borden in Canada. You got to repeat your experiments. And they poked lots and lots and lots of wells into a really, really simple aquifer. So these are basically sand aquifers. And if you punch 10,000 holes into a bucket of sand, you can understand groundwater flow. 
And they did a lot of papers on that. But if you imagine being the poor undergraduate that has to go sample the wells, it's going to take you a little while. Um, these are not simple efforts. But um, the idea was to get a better understanding of how to move forward in groundwater. And with 10,000 borings, you prove some of the science of how groundwater works. It doesn't give you a technique to walk into Joe's gas station or Bob's dry cleaners and clean it up or to find water supply when you're trying to look for fractures or faults and you've got something where I could poke 10,000 holes and not actually hit the target. So um, it's a great way to do the science of groundwater flow, not a great way to provide tools to the industry to move forward. So if you look at the other industries and how they deal with complexity, um, they all basically went to the same thing. We should take some sort of scan and basically some sort of geophysical tool and look around before we cut into our patient. The guy on the left went to the dentist. Um, he had a sore in the roof of his mouth. Um, and it, he had a little bit of blurriness in his eye, but mostly the roof of his mouth hurt. So he figured it was something to do with his teeth. Um, the dentist said, I I'm not for you. This is really not my, my thing I can help you with. And a simple scan said, you should probably see somebody else and get that fixed. Um, he actually had a uh, nail gun backfire is how he ended up that way. Um, with that is the way people think scanning should work is that I hand that photo to a five-year-old, say, please diagnose this guy's problem. The five-year-old says he's got a nail in his head and you should go on. And that's how scanning is supposed to work. Um, but if you look at the image to the right, that's an oil field and we need to put in a boring to produce oil at a rate that's commercially profitable. Where do I stick the hole in those pinks and oranges? I don't know. Well, what about if I go back to the medical side, which molar needs the cavity filled? I don't know. Then you need something more than a five-year-old to answer those questions. You need to look at the images. And in most of these disciplines, it's about a five-year effort uh, to get good at reading the pictures, uh, whichever kind of pictures you're reading. So when you bring in scanning tools, you have something that requires training, and then you have to adapt them into the industry. So um, seismic started out from uh, the Titanic sinking. If you didn't know where that all started. And they wanted to try to find a boat underneath the ocean, and they thought they could use sound waves and listen to the metal as you hit it with sound. And then folks in Oklahoma said, oh, I think we could find oil with that. And this is the state where seismic for exploration was born. But um, they then started trying to do it on a consulting basis. And there's a quote at the bottom that's a little bit covered up by the box. But it basically says that guys that were trying to do seismology, which is considered to be an incredibly respectable uh, career now in geology. But back in 1920, it was, you guys are crazy. You let off dynamite and you're gonna tell me where the stuff's at. I'll find the guy with a stick and watch the sticks cross and we'll do that instead. Um, that, that had more respect because at least people knew what it was and guys running around with dynamite with microphones, um, that, that didn't make any sense to people. So um, it takes a while to adapt to a scanning technology and I've been working at it for 20 years. In another 20, we'll, we'll be much further along, but it, it's not a very quick business development. We're gonna think about a couple things. I'm gonna to talk to you about thinking about going under the ground, but thinking about electrically. If you've worked with anything in the ground, you might've th thought about soil, you might've thought about rocks, you might've thought about fluids, you might've thought about samples that you're holding in a lab somewhere. Um, I'm gonna tell you how to think about the ground by feeling electricity go through it and where it goes through easier and where it goes through more difficult. Um, or if you wanna think about it, that where it goes through easily and is nice and conductive is the bright spots, and then where it's hard to get electricity through, those are the dark spots. And so we'll think about bright and dark parts of a picture. And then we're gonna go through a couple of examples of looking in the subsurface so you can kind of get a feel for the way that you might look around under the ground. And then we'll think about where that might go in the future. So um, about 2000, I was doing well hydraulics, drilling holes, pumping water between them and figuring out how the ground worked. And I figured out the ground's really complicated. Um, that nice 10,000 borings was in a simple aquifer. They didn't do an experiment like that in a really nasty, complicated aquifer. They did it in the simplest stuff in the world. And they still scratched their heads up until they got to about 10,000 data points. Um, 
So, you know, we still, to this day, our first procedure of we need to find water or we need to clean up a site is most commonly we get out a drill rig and we start poking holes and we go, oh, there's some here. Oh, there's nothing over here, some over there. And we start to try to map out that way. And if you had a surgeon do that when because you had a stomach ache, um, you would not be very pleased and you'd likely be deceased. But that's how they used to do in the 1800s. We'd cut you open, give you a nice chunk of leather to chew on, and we'd pop you open and look around in there. It wasn't super successful. It's not super successful in our industry, but it's still our standard protocol. Um, so it was, well, why are we doing this? And you go, okay, well, maybe it's so cheap to drill that poking 10,000 holes is super cheap. A borehole on average is about $125,000 investment. People go, well, it only actually cost me 10,000 to put the borehole in. You go, well, did you send somebody out there to sample it? Yeah. Did they send the sample back to the lab? Yeah. Did, did you pay those people? Yeah. Did you have to go sample that every quarter? Yeah. How long have you been sampling that? 30 years. That hole in the ground becomes pretty expensive over time. Um, so even if it's a $10,000 borehole to begin with, it gets to be a very expensive borehole. So when you look at lifetime cost, every time you poke into the ground has significant cost. but people don't feel it at the start. They say, oh, I'm just gonna spend a bit and put in a couple boreholes. Well, you already have a hundred, I know. I'm gonna put in two more and they're gonna tell me way more than the first hundred. Why do you think that? Well, cause I got budget for two more holes. I don't have budget for doing other things. So it's a weird social component. Um, Maybe scans don't see anything. And so we went with that idea and that was the research we did was we were taking scans and they didn't see anything. And so we figured out how to make the scans better. And that's the technology we utilize. And then cultural issues. If the recipe book that says, I need to find people water, let me look at what the state regulations say, or I need to clean up this gas station. Let me look at what the state regulations say. If they said, you have spill, we need to protect the public please drill three holes and go from there. If the regulations never say, well, take a scan first, you're not going to do it. If you went to the doctor and the insurance company said, no, no, you have a broken leg, they can probably fix it. If we take an x-ray, that'll cost us more money. We're not going to pay for that. You wouldn't get an x-ray on your leg. What they figured out is you don't take the x-ray on the leg, it can go wrong and cost us a lot more money. We'll pay for the x-ray. Um, and that culture shift happened in the medical industry, it happened in the oil industry, it hasn't happened in the environmental industry. When you build a business, and I didn't know this when we started the business, I knew nothing, I knew very little about business. I knew you had to make money or you go out of business, but I didn't have, you know, a whole bunch of business classes and an accounting class and things. I was a scientist, and if you're a scientist and you start a business, you probably aren't going to go get a business degree first. So, um, but there's two business models. There's better, faster, cheaper. Here's an 1882 better mouse trap. You hook up your gun and when the mouse comes out, it fires a bullet. Um, that mouse trap didn't win and that business went out of business. Um, but it was a better, faster or cheaper way attempt to deal with your mice problem. Um, and if you find out that somebody else is better, faster or cheaper, you're gonna buy that mouse trap. And if you have to get a mouse trap, you all know roughly what a mouse trap is. I have mice and I want to kill them. Um, I will go find something. And so currently a wooden board with a spring and a wire is the cheapest and one of the best options and people do that. Um, if you have a better way to do it or a faster way to do it or a cheaper way to do it, you can open up your own mouse trap company. Um, Brave New World is, you guys don't do this, but you're all gonna do this. Um, so iPhones came out and you didn't walk around with a computer and a phone and uh, most people don't even really think about the phone part anymore and you don't usually make voice phone calls so we still call them a phone but we rarely use them as such um, so it's a different way to operate in the world um, the mall cops have one of these but the idea when that came out was instead of walking around everybody's gonna get one of these things and you're gonna replace a bunch of cars and you're gonna do all that and there'll be millions and millions and millions of these around. It didn't work. I mean, brave new world companies are, if I change the world and you guys all start driving on this, this guy is filthy rich. If the world doesn't change, you don't make any money. Um, and so brave new world companies are tricky because you got to figure out how the culture is going to change in the future. 
not just that you're showing somebody I'm making something better, faster, cheaper that you already use. So trying to get the environmental industry to scan isn't better, faster, cheaper. I'm not showing you that I'm gonna clean up your site in a better, faster, cheaper way. I'm saying you're gonna do something different than you've done before, but I could point to other industries and say, just like those guys do. Um, and, and that's helpful, but it doesn't necessarily get the culture to change. So if we think about what we're trying to do scientifically, here's a flow net from the 1940s. Um, and you're gonna figure out how water's flowing under the ground. You're gonna poke some holes. Here we have a half dozen wells, and we're gonna figure out where water goes under the ground. And we're gonna measure water levels and interpret what happens. But we've got like, uh, you're gonna have like six, eight data points and um, you can use the surface stream and get up to eight data points now. Um, if one of the wells isn't built right, your numbers might not be right. And so you've got very little data and you're gonna make some broad interpretations. And what we found out when you go to clean up contaminants using a method like this is you're wrong a lot of the time. Um, and so works reasonably well for figuring out where water flows. Um, doesn't work so great for cleaning up a dry cleaner or a gas station. So here's what we do instead. And so this was 20 years of trying to figure out how to build a better mousetrap that doesn't involve a gun and to create a brave new world for scanning sites and then being able to clean them up. So this is a gas station in Missouri. Well, actually, it's a rental yard where they had a tank that they would supply the gas to the rental stuff. Um, flat surface in a karst area where water flows down into sinkholes, except for at the surface, it's just flat and limestone and the sinkholes are somewhere in the subsurface and you've got to figure out where they're at below your feet um, with some sort of tool. So they took um, and drilled around and you never got below 40 feet uh, through the soil and you hit the bedrock and they mapped that out and they said, okay, the bottom of this site is at 40 feet. And we found some of the gasoline near the tank, but it's down at the regional water table, about a hundred feet down. And our water table at like 30 feet is contaminated with gas, but we don't know where it went down to a hundred feet. So did the scans and said, you know, you've got a couple of subsurface holes here, one over here and one over here. So we biopsy the two tumors. And you go, okay, well, what happened? Well, one, there wasn't anything in that tumor, but it was a it was a nice pit. The borehole went way deeper than 40 feet. We actually ran out of pipe, but there wasn't anything there. Okay, well, what's the other one say? Well, 40 feet is the bottom of the site. And a lot of times when you contract for drilling, you say, go to 40 feet, that's the bottom of the site. And that will go to 40 feet and stop and then pull out. In this case, we said, no, no, the picture says go deeper. And so they went deeper. Um, they ran out of pipe at 55 feet because they knew they would never get below 40. But at about 45 feet down below the bottom of the site, they started hitting high concentrations of fuel. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, so here's the hole that this stuff ran down. Um, and so they could figure out where that connection is. When you said, okay, well, if you guys want to clean up the regional table, we could take deeper images and you guys could clean that problem by seeing where it's at. And what did the state say? State, of course, said, this worked really, really well. It showed us exactly where to look. We were drilling at random, but the regional one, we don't want to spend money like that. We'll just keep drilling down there 100 feet deep until we solve the problem. The problem hasn't been solved yet, but that's the approach. And so even if you demonstrate the technology works, you demonstrate this fixes the problem, it doesn't necessarily mean people will apply it to the next time they have a problem or the exact same problem where they have to look at something different. Um, and so it's a funny thing to bring these technologies to market because even proving it works doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna buy it. Very similar to thinking about the little mall cop thing. It works fine, but doesn't necessarily mean people are gonna invest in it. But if you're looking in the subsurface, um, we're trying to think about several things. You're trying to think about what the geology is. You're trying to think about what the hydrogeology is where the fluids are moving inside those rocks. You're trying to think about who's living down there and a lot of contaminated sites if the microbes would eat it, I don't have to clean it up. I'll just have the microbes do it. Or do they need some help? Do you guys need it? I gave you plenty of cheeseburgers. You got fuel. Do you need some oxygen down there? Or what do you need? 
um, and maybe you need some vitamin B. Um, so figuring those things out, can we get a bioactivity conceptual site model? Um, and then where's the contaminants, right? And, and do we need to deal with them? So um, the end result is you're gonna take and do the exact same thing the oil industry does. You're gonna take a geophysical data set, in this case, really high density electrical data. You're gonna marry that to biopsies where you figure out what that means distribution wise. And you're gonna go from there and, and fix your problem as opposed to saying, huh, hasn't cleaned up yet. We should drill some more holes. Um, my oldest site I've been called on was started in 1914. And the regulator said, you guys should clean up that problem. I got called in like 2000 and 2014. So about a hundred years later, they said, hey, let's try something different because poking holes didn't work. So it can go on for quite a long time. My normal case is somebody calling me with something from the 90s. Um, so that's normally who calls. And they've been poking holes for since the 90s. Um, basically, for a lot of you, your entire life, they've been poking holes. And now they're going to try something different. Or at least think about trying something different. What we're going to do scientifically is we're going to take the same measurement that people environmentally have been taking for a really long time. If you go in and pull water out of a well, you can take an EC measurement. You can send the water back to a lab and they'll give you an EC measurement, the electrical conductance of the water. And so it's a four electrode measurement that tells you how easy it is to put electricity through there. But you use four electrodes because it gets you a really precise measurement. So instead of roughly knowing how easy the electricity through there, you know to like five decimal places. Then what you can do, back in the 80s, we used to take reels of wire and we could do electrical drilling. And you would change where your reels of wire are at and you could get data set going vertically down through your aquifer. And if you had a really good crew, you'd have four people on each one on each cable and you have somebody at the box and they would play with the box to get the number out. It took them about five minutes and you could get about 80 measurements a day. Um, in the nineties, they said, you know, we got computers and we can have the computer do the switching for us. And so you could put out all the electrodes at once and tell the computer, go sample for me. And the computer also could play with the box and figure out the measurement faster than a human could. And so we could take 80 measurements in like two minutes. Um, so one of my pictures here, if we were doing that in 1985, would take roughly a month of field work. Um, but we take that picture in a couple hours. So the things we're doing, you couldn't have done it in the old days. And so the technology, you had to wait until computing got fast enough, until the acquisition got fast enough to process one of these data sets. If I try to process it on a computer in the 1990s and said, please develop my picture for me, it would take you uh, like starting it on a Friday and coming back on Monday. Um, now I can process in like a half an hour. So it still taxes a modern computer, but we can do it in a reasonable amount of time. So you develop the picture and you get a kilopixel camera working in the subsurface for you that you can see down there and, and figure out what you're working with on a kilopixel camera basis. You guys work with megapixels or gigapixels or however good your cameras work in these days. Um, this is not as high resolution, but really useful because you can see around in the dark. Um, in terms of the company side, we had to figure out how to do that. And the idea here is not to do a geophysical experiment. People, when they when we talk about working with people, either on an academic or commercial, they said, oh, you're doing geophysics. No, no, I'm doing electrical hydrogeology. They said, what's the difference? Geophysicists want to play with the knobs. They want to try new things. We want to do the exact same thing every single time such that the data sets are comparable all across the site, across to other sites. And it's very similar to saying, I'm going to sample benzene on my site for gasoline. I want a nice benzene sample. You don't want to bring a chemist out there because they'll be like, oh, we could put that in this machine or we could put it in that machine. Let's try this field machine. Oh, we now have eight different measurements of benzene with their own different error bars. You know, Great, but I just need to figure out how to clean this up. And you don't want an experiment on chemistry, but we still want an experiment on the physics, which is really bizarre to me. And we want to call in the geophysicist. Like, don't call in the geophysicist. It's not going to help you. It's like calling in a chemist on a site where you're trying to clean it up. It's not going to help. You want to do hydrogeology. You want a good data set across the site. So everything's done the same way. There's 56 electrodes. It's a five to one ratio. So your line's five times longer than you look down. So if you want to look down 100 feet, you need 500 foot long. If you want to look down a thousand feet, you need a mile of cable, um, but you're not limited by the physics. You look as deep as you like. 
You need to go over different surfaces. Well, grass is easy. Water's easy too. Not easy for a drill rig, but easy to take electrical measurements. You take a pool noodle, float the cable, and all you gotta do is touch the water. Now you're connected and I can shoot electricity. Um, and people worry about uh, if I drive up earthworms, if I kill fish, if I kill dogs, if they come and bite the cable, you're not doing currents that you're running at all the time, you're pulsing things. And so at best your dog might yelp a little bit if, if it hits it at just the right time in the right spot. Um, you could do the same thing with an undergrad holding the cable, um, but you're not killing anybody. So, um, but going through buildings, people go, well, I want to look under the building. That's where we spilled this stuff. Well, we can go and shoot straight through the building and look underneath it without having to dig up the building or put a drill rig inside of it. And we've gone by big equipment and all sorts of stuff and just take a picture underneath the ground. Going through railroad tracks and stuff, it's stuff that you get asked to do. So we did all the engineering to figure out all the places. And there's basically no place on the planet that's hard for us to look except for a transformer yard. And transformer yards, they'll put a big metal grid underneath them. Makes it hard to take a picture underneath them, but you can look pictures on the side of them. You put in monitoring wells and you know what you could sample water once or you could go back and sample it next quarter or next month or after you ejected something and go hey how did it change and that's really useful we can do the same thing electrically we can trench in we're trenching in right now in the arbuckle simpson and putting in a cable so we can watch it do recharge over time um, or you just put in electrodes and come hook a cable back up and look before and after you shoot stuff in the ground to try to clean it up so you can monitor over time your well, instead of having a chunk of PVC in it, has a cable in it. You pull the cable out and plug in and you take another picture. So you can watch how the changes occur over time and those can be really sensitive. So let's look at some examples. Um, the thing I didn't realize is uh, I, I didn't go into the medical profession because if you guys had cancer and I was the person that took your scan, I would tell you you had cancer. And I'm, I'm told as a doctor, you're not supposed to do that. You gotta figure out if they're emotionally ready for that and how, you know, is their family going to take that? And you, you got to like have empathy, but I'm too much of a scientist. The data says you got cancer. Sorry. Um, and very, very sorry if your family does have cancer or something, but I don't have like the bill for that. I'm like, the data says this. I didn't figure out that when you tell somebody, sorry, your chlorinated site is much more contaminated than you thought that they would freak out. And like expecting a patient that you told to freak out when you tell them something bad, that doesn't surprise me. Telling somebody your dry cleaner is much worse than we thought. I didn't think I had to be a doctor that figured out how to deliver that message. Um, but it is something I ended up having to do over 20 years is how do I tell the customer that their patient is way worse than they thought? Because they call me to clean it up because I need to take some scans. We got one well that's just a little dirty but we can't figure out why. And I take the picture and I'm like, cause you've got a ton of stuff down there. It's really cool. You missed it all with your wells. They don't want to know that. <laughs> they want me to go, oh, it's pretty good. It'll just be this little thing. You'll be fine. And if I come in and say, oh yeah, your patient is so sick. This is really awesome. You want to see the pictures? They, they really don't respond well to that. So we'll look at something nice and simple. Um, we're going to have a little plot. We're going to run water over it and do infiltration into soil. So we're gonna set up some images and we're gonna watch water run into the ground. Nice small 10 meter kind of domain, small picture. We're gonna look at stuff running in the ground. And this is our ground. It's fairly electrically resistive. You get these trapezoids and it says there's some sort of boundary there. And uh, if you look at this orange, that's where water is gonna end up running in. If we then say, okay, well, that's the ground. I'm gonna add water. How should it change electrically? Well, it was dry, now it's wet. Probably gonna be more conductive. Um, so that's what you get is you get some more conductive ground. So the ground got more conductive and you go, okay, well, I don't know if that was super useful. I thought the ground would get more conductive. Well, I could tell you where, ah, is that still super useful? Well, I could start looking at how it got wet. And so I can figure out that it went down like a normal soil and the moisture came in and started propagating downward like the little diagram from the books. But I might find that you had a macro pore and that the water went straight through the soil to the bedrock. Or I could find out that it was flowing out from the sides of your plot and going out laterally. 
or I could find out that nothing happened. And it turns out for a lot of environmental problems, figuring out nothing happened is really, really useful because showing that nothing happened says, I don't need to worry about it yet. Whereas if something happens, well, now I got to worry about that spot. Um, so nothing, proving nothing is actually a fairly useful thing to prove. But what you can then do is take those results and you can map out how fast water went through the entire domain. And instead of getting a measurement of hydraulic properties, you get a map of them and you can think about the distribution of how water moves through this entire image worth of data. So you go, well, but it's only 10 meters in size. What does that do for me? I can make this image as big as I like and I can do the same technique and watch water run through whatever chunk of groundwater you want. I just have to watch it over time and see what happens and maybe let rain go through instead of uh, adding my own water. Um, another case, here we're in the uh, middle of Australia and the reason this set of rooms was there was that's where the telegraph went through to the central Australia back in the day. Um, and the reason the telegraph went through there was there was water. And if you didn't have water, the people trying to run the telegraph would die. And this was the spot that had fresher water than all the other places. And so that's where they built the telegraph through there. Um, but if we look at a cable or run a cable across that thing, we're a little bigger now. We got the Statue of Liberty for scale. So we're 300, uh, we're 300 feet deep. We're basically a little over half kilometer long line. We'll switch units between you. But we can then watch what the groundwater is doing. And we see in the sandstones that we have saltier water. It's more conductive and it's coming up to the spring. But we also have a chunk coming up from the granite. And instead of mapping out a flow net by poking in wells, which we're not allowed to do at this site because it's a preserved site and you're not allowed to bring a drill rig, you can take pictures and see how the flow is operating um, and, and be able to elucidate how groundwater is discharging and find out where the fresher water is coming from. And it's coming from the granite. So it's about 10% of the flow is granitic and a fresher water. And it tilts the quality of the spring enough that you'd want to build your telegraph station there. But you're taking it as a picture and you go, well, I don't have water chemistry. Nope. I can get that from the spring at the top. Well, what else didn't I get? Well, it was different from the well. It was. And so when people got well data, they found out things that were different than they knew before. Um, and they got used to reading that data. And so that's where the culture developed is I'm used to reading well data. Reading pictures is not something people were used to saying, where is it conductive? What does that mean for the flow of water? What does that mean for my chemistry? But once you get good at reading the pictures, um, my employees that have been working for me for five plus years now, I hand them a picture of a contaminated site. They said, oh, this thing's happening. And the newer ones are like, what are you looking at? And they're like, see this and this and this. That obviously means this is happening. But you get good at reading your data sets. Um, so very similar to looking at a dentist who's been around for 20 years. They read your x-ray and they go, oh, we got to fix that cavity. The new dentist is going, you sure it's a cavity? Yeah, I'm sure. I've been looking at these for 20 years and drilling them. I know what they look like. Western Oklahoma, nice red bedrock um, and nice alluvial aquifer. Um, problem out there was that the conceptual model was that you have the alluvium on top of the bedrock, about 36 meters worth, and it's all fine material, low hydraulic conductivity, water doesn't move through it all that well. Um, fresh water to brackish, you know, so a little bit salty out there. And the groundwater model, I think the technical term is it, it sucks. It doesn't do very well at predicting things out there. Um, so I said, hey, you know, could we take some field data? Because a model is a representation of an integration of field data. Well, no, we just want to update the model. But you don't want to collect any additional field data. Well, no, that would cost money. Well, that's great, but updating a model where you know it's not working without actually collecting any data doesn't get you to a better model, but it is cheaper. Um, so we did convince them to let us go collect some data. And very quickly, you could see the conceptual model is wrong. And so this is the data set and the conductive part of that alluvial aquifer. There's the 36 meter of an aquifer. It's got a little bit of variability. And then there's these things. And on all the lines they showed up, that's uh, just shy of a kilometer worth of data. And there's these big things sitting at the bottom. And you go, oh, what is that thing? Um, 
it looks like there's a little buried channel. Uh, and you go, okay, well, what would that be filled with? It'd be filled with sediments from the Ogallala. That's not fine sediments. Nope. Um, and then if you look around, you'll find that boreholes in that aquifer that have nothing except from red bedrock below 36 meters have deep boreholes and gravel. Not a lot, just a couple. But you know from the well data, if you just had the well data, you'd be like, oh, I bet they did that wrong. Uh, when you discount it. But if you got the pictures, you're like, well, your odds are one or twice, once or twice, you're going to hit the good spot. And they did. Um, so we had data already that they hit the good spot. And so we could map out that channel. Um, if you map that out, the existing model is the green line, the surface is the red line, and the depth of the aquifer is actually the blue line. But it's skinny aquifer. So there's this little skinny aquifer that's got really, really good flow. It's got more storage than the big giant lake at the end of the aquifer in the surface water body. So it's a really huge water resource for that part of Oklahoma. That was basically nobody knew about it because um, it wasn't wasn't part of the model. Um, but the data set collected in the field said, oh, your model's probably wrong and here's how to deal with it. Um, but how to manage that and how to deal with that is still something that the water board still updates their 20 year models. And you go, should we take some data? Uh, data costs money. Okay, but are we doing any good just updating the model with the data from 20 years ago? So it's something to manage on, on a conceptual basis for the industry. If you're going to do really long lines, uh, 10 meter lines are easy. You just plug them in and you ask, hey, how's that end of the line? You want to go kilometer scale and start thinking about regional models? Um, it, a little bit trickier. One thing is that most cables that you work with electrically are built with a soy product. And it turns out that rabbits, cows, horses, donkeys, um, mice all think it smells good. And, and I, I tell people it smells like carrots. And I had somebody who was a biologist when I talked, so it actually doesn't smell like carrots to them. Da, 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 da. I'm like, for my world, they want to eat it. It smells like a carrot to a rabbit to me. Um, but they definitely want to chew on it. So if you leave these out overnight, you will have them consumed. And they don't actually get a lot of nutritional benefit out of it, but it does destroy your experiment. So you got to lay these things out fast enough and bring them back up fast enough, or you got to make them taste like cayenne pepper in some way. Um, so that gets problematic in other ways. So we use power reels to do that. And you um, can then start doing big scale things. So these are kilometer scale lines, a little bigger than the kilometer. Um, there's still a trapezoid with the red and the green as the, the two ends of the trapezoid and a U.S. football field for scale there. So you get a sense of these are pretty big things to deal with. But now we can look at regional scale models and have data to support what's happening there. And we can then map out things on a regional scale without poking 10,000 holes. Give you a sense of scale. That first experiment I showed you is the orange trapezoid up at the top. These are a little bigger scale. Um, so you're still dealing with trapezoids, you're still dealing with data sets, but now you can deal with data sets at different scales and think about what's happening in different ways. And you could do that on a static basis or you could do it on a temporal basis. And you can decide on experiments that'll let you look at an aquifer and understand the process you're trying to understand. So here's that image. It has a really beautiful fault in it. And you can see that fault and I'm left with domain. So high camera, there's a fault there. Um, so that big, beautiful fault was seen in a helicopter electromagnetic data set. They said, there's a minor fault. We see a little crack there. And you can see that that fault doesn't make it to the surface. Um, so the helicopter could see, I think I see a crack. The ground-based stuff says, actually, that's a really big crack. That's a nice big fault. So we drilled holes on both ends of it in those little blue areas. And if you look at the distance, you're drilling holes that are a football field apart to hit the same fault. The other thing that is when you drill into these things, and we've drilled into these kinds of features on clean sites and contaminated sites, consistently, we piss off drilling folks. You bring your drill rig out there, you're drilling in, nobody ever gives you a target like that. They give you a chunk of rock and you're drilling through rock. You hit chunks of rock like this, the rock gets really broken up, you lose circulation, life gets really unpleasant for you as a driller. So I was standing there when they drilled the upper one, they hit the blue dot, all the circulation was lost, the driller started cussing, and I was super happy. 
And uh, the driller's like, why are you happy? I'm like, because we hit the target. I said, what do you mean hit the target? I said, oh, we're targeting these. To what? I said, well, these pictures. They said, wait a minute, it looks like a fault. I said, yeah, that's what you just hit. Said, Nobody told us we're drilling faults. So you got to let them know. We did a contaminated site. They couldn't build any wells because the rock that we give them was so rotten that there was nothing there to build a well around. So they would pre-pack a well and pre-build it, send it down, and then concrete it in a top where the rock was good. And if they knew that in advance, they could do it. If they didn't know in advance, there was three days of screaming and then finding out that these idiots knew we were drilling into a piece of rock that's rotten. Um, so doing that's pretty handy. If you're uh, if you ever had a structural geology class, there's a parent dip where if you got an angle fault and you look at it from different directions, you get a different view. So this one, we're cutting straight across that fault. This guy, we're not. It's a little kind of dipsy do. We're hitting a crack at an oblique angle. So it ends up looking different in the picture. But we can then go think about where, where those cracks might connect in space. So if we take a slice of that data set, we can see a connection between the sinkhole on one end of this site and the spring over in the other end. The cool thing about that connection is it's largely above the water table. So this site flows to the south normally, except during really big storm events. If the water table comes up enough, the water table will turn and flow that way. And so we're trying to study how do you predict recharge if it changes direction depending on the water level and how do you watch that so we've put in cables around there that we're going to watch the groundwater come up and watch it go down and see which direction it's going. So we've got wells and cables installed to be able to look around there. What happens if you throw some nasty stuff in the ground? So if we have some contaminants in there. Uh, that's Mary O'Kelly with a hammer. Uh, she was the head of the Oklahoma uh, Corporation Commission Petroleum Storage Tank Division. That's the head person cleaning up gas stations in the state. And next to her is John Wilson from the EPA lab in Ada. Um, if you come out to, to see what's going on, I always make sure people entertain and they gave them hammers and let them put in stakes and hook up cables. Um, but if we start sticking in stuff like napples, gasoline solvents, non-aqueous phase liquids, where it doesn't blend in with the water, people thought you need to have it filled up to be able to see it. You gotta block all the water out of there to be able to see anything. But in reality, all you need is enough that you start touching the grains together and filling the pore throats. And if you calculate, well, how much is that? Somewhere like a part per million, you can clog up the pores in a chunk of sand. And so electrically, it'd be harder to pass electricity through it. We also found out that when something starts eating your gasoline and you got microbes, they make the ground conductive. and Almost everything microbial is conductive. The slime that they attach themselves with, they'll put wires out to talk to their buddies and transfer electrons around. They'll build full cables. Um, they do some really crazy electrical stuff. The only thing resistive they make is if they eat um, the wrong food and they don't take their gas X, they produce methane and other gases. Um, and if that builds up, you'll make a bubble in the subsurface. And that makes a resistor in my pictures. I get resistive bubble pictures. Um, and so you get mostly conductors with microbial activity, but occasionally you'll get bubbles that are resistant. So if you put that in a tank, um, you can watch the napple come across because we made it glow, but we can then also watch it electrically and see it get more resistive and see what it's doing and be able to watch that and figure out how much do you need to get a signature. Um, for the microbial side, um, there's a quote from Harvard there that basically says, we're in the lab, we're under controlled conditions, I've got a clean lab, I've got everything set, and my crib activity still does whatever it damn well pleases. So in the outdoors underneath a gas station somewhere, you're, you're not going to control life, you can kind of watch life, but if you want me to tell you why they're doing stuff, the guys in the lab can't figure out why they're doing things, you can just watch them. So outdoors don't give me a higher standard than what they do in the lab. Um, but if you thought about the cheese as the nice fuel chunk, that's a nice resistor. Um, it's a nice liquid resistor you put in the ground. If you then start putting bacteria on it and making it conductive, it's the mold on your cheese or the mold on your bread. If you get a nice college dorm room fridge um, where the mold has completely covered it, now it's a conductor. 
And yeah, there might be a resistive heart in that thing if you cut it open and start trying to dig out the good stuff, but otherwise it's a big conductor in the subsurface. And so when we look at new sites, um, they're fresh cheese, nice resistors. If you look at old sites, they start to get conductive chunks around there and then really, really old sites are really, really conductive. So um, we have places where nothing grows. That's your fruitcake subsurfaces. Great food, nothing wants to eat it. Um, and when you say, well, why? I don't know, ask the microbiologist to why those guys aren't happy, but I got sites where stuff is just preserved in the subsurface, nothing is eating it. And I got sites that shouldn't be moldy and it's super moldy down there. So life does what it wants. Um, there's a zoom in. And so that's the little wires they connect things with. Um, not all of them have nano wires, but those are really good for electricity tra transmission. So knowing those things about contaminants, I'm gonna give you the mystery case. We have a seat coming out and a tidal flat, and there's actually a bunch of little spots that hydrocarbons coming out. Regulator says, make that stop. Regulator said that in the 90s. They poked holes, they did models, they brought in different people who poked different holes, they ran different models, they pulled different samples, they did isotopes. They basically brought in anybody who had a different answer, and some people had the same answer and said, well, the last guys weren't smart enough. I'm much smarter. And 30 years later, they still have seeps coming out. So I, they brought me in and I said, well, I'm expecting you've got an infection somewhere. It's gotten microbially active and they're making surfactant and it's squirting out of there somewhere. Like, but the whole thing is low permeability. We've got low perm stuff. We've got low perm fill over low perm stuff underneath that. We've got nothing that flows fast, but we're still oozing. Um, so what is that? So our first picture was out on the water because all we got to do is float and take a look. And we can see that our layered model is fine except for our stuff comes from beneath our model. 40 foot below, uh, and this, the water is actually at sea level, so it's kind of handy. Um, 40 foot below sea level is where the bottom of what we ever thought about was sitting. Um, and that's where stuff came from, from below that. And you go, okay, well, the first picture says it's not what you guys thought. And it's not what I even guessed. And it's not conductive. The conductive stuff is off the side. It's resistive stuff from deeper than you thought. And you go, but, but gasoline spills or fuel spills float. They're light, non-aqueous phase liquids. They float. Yeah, you can have a diving plume. You can have a groundwater system that if you've got a conductivity difference, you can make that stuff dive. Well, yeah, but that's weird. What would that look like? Well, it looks something like this is that maybe if you had something high permeability down below that that would have where the flow is and then it would squirt up out of there at the boundary of the coast. Well, maybe. I said, well, what's down there? And the geologist said, well, we mapped that. Those are Pleistocene channels. Really good stuff for flow. Oh, okay. Well, that part's there. The geology model was suitable to have this happen. Um, I said, well, we got to see some evidence with drilling. Can you drill that? So went back to the coast where it's easier to drill. And we had this nice resistive target down there. Poke the hole. Now, when you are underneath a whole bunch of fines and you get to a really sandy spot, that is unpleasant. You get flowing sands that tries to come in and tries to destroy your well. It did that. But they knew it and they worked on it. They got it installed and they got 11 feet of free product in that well. 40 feet below the water table. So solve their problem in terms of telling them what's wrong. So, well, what do you do to fix that? I'd get rid of all that stuff that's way down there. Um, but they drilled a well 60 feet down when normally they've been drilling down about 20 feet. Um, and they had a problem that was different than they thought. The physics, you could explain it once you knew it, but the ability to find it with drilling, they had drilled it for 30 years and they'd even drilled down into that sand and found nothing. So. Um, knowing where to look is pretty handy. So if we look at things electrically, you get conductive, resistive, and you're trying to read what those all mean. And they might be at a one-time shot. It might be over time. Useful for small things, useful for bigger things. It depends on what you're trying to take a picture of. You need to be able to integrate data. You need to be able to work in 3D. So all the skills of computing in the modern era, of being able to get a computer fast enough to rotate a site in 3D, it, it's it's really, really handy. We can apply new tools that we could never apply before. And a real quick view of the future. 
and you go from fortune teller to predictive analytics on a computer, they're still charging you money to tell you the future. Let me know, give me 10 bucks, I'll tell you the futures. So um, what you gotta do is get rid of the geophysicist. So this is the good old days. You had to have the photographer come out. Nobody has a photographer at the wedding anymore, very few. They just have a whole bunch of people with iPhones and have them take pictures. And they might bring somebody in and do a little bit of work, but you don't need a professional person to bring out a camera anymore. Just walk around with iPhones and take your pictures. So you need to be able to do that, be able to send people out and either hook up to a cable and take a picture or that they go lay a cable out and take a picture. But take those pictures and be able to watch the systems, um, but do it on a um, lower technical level where people can just drive out, um, go out with a new truck that has the plugins, plug into it, hook up to the cables, take your picture, you got your quarterly sample. Um, and you can then see if anything changed and maybe you want nothing to have changed. And it's really, really hard to get nothing. It's really, really easy to get changes. It's really, really hard to get nothing. So if you're trying to demonstrate nothing's occurring, really good technology for that. And then as you move forward, we've got a bunch of tools that aren't being used environmentally and we need some more tools. So there's a lot of stuff still to do and everybody thinks, oh, well, we're kind of done with adapting technologies, but your data sets now have to be transferable and in 3D. You have to think about where you're at. So you've got to make sure you're collecting location data really well. And that's centimeter scale. Um, we collect cores, we're still kind of primitive with it. Eh, it's brown sand. It's like, there's a lot more things we could do. And now video is pretty easy. So we should be scanning cores and doing things to store that data in more effective ways, other than having somebody, eh, brown sand, chuck it out. Um, we should be doing some more advanced things on cores. And monitoring wells are called that because they're not characterization wells. You're not gonna get to 10,000 data points to sort things out. So then when you go to integrate these data sets, somebody's gotta be paid to do that. To integrate a data set for this, it's between 100 and 300 hours. That's after we collect the data from the field to where we decide where to poke a hole. It's like, well, you guys must not be very smart. It took you 100 hours to figure out where to put the hole. No, we got people that looked at this for a long time. It's just that long to work through all the data. Um, so it's not something that's super fast, but somebody's gotta pay that bill. Um, so you gotta work on that. Um, and you don't fix up a model by drawing a better cartoon. You're gonna take some field data somehow if you wanna get better. So that's electrical hydrogeology. If you got questions, I'd be happy to answer them and hopefully I've not pissed off the little magic box too much. How much, how much do you guys prepare for the to get out of the people? How much preparation does it take to get out of the people? So there's uh, a few planning meetings of figuring out what their problem is and then, you know, what size or multiple sizes of image we need and also figuring out, well, I'd like the cable to keep going the other side of this room. They go, ooh, can't do that. That landowner is really unhappy. You got to keep the cables on this side of that line. Um, and so you got to do all those things. You got to do utility locates, make sure that you don't poke a hole into a fiber optic. That makes your day really unpleasant and probably collapses a company. Um, it used to be you'd worry about water mains or you'd worry about gas lines. Fiber optic is the one you definitely don't want to hit now. That can cost you millions per day, um, which is really, really unpleasant to have a million dollar bill per day come in. Your company's gone after a couple of days. The worst one I've ever heard of was at Thanksgiving. They hit a fiber optic on Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Good luck getting that repaired. Um, and so they were paying a bill for, I think, $2 million a day. And I think Monday somebody came out. Um, so don't hit that stuff. And then um, working dynamically, um, bringing the data up in 3D with somebody and saying, okay, we thought this is what was gonna occur. First day picture says, you're wrong. This is not what's going on. This is what's happening. And do we need to make any changes? Or no, no, that was working fine, except for it's gone further west than you thought. And we might wanna take a couple more pictures and catch the rest of it. Um, and so there's there's those parts too. So. There's, there's probably uh, between the people that are working the site and then us on the imaging site, you probably burning through 20 to 40 hours before you ever go out. And then uh, you're spending uh, two, two days to two weeks normally. Um, if you're doing a monitoring job, you might be out there a really long time, depending on what you're monitoring for. If you're monitoring for an emergency issue and you're trying to do human health and safety, 
you might be monitoring continuously to say, okay, if this happens, I can tell you electrically. So you want me to tell you that nothing happened. And if I get nothing, that's the best answer for you. Um, and so we've had people pay us to tell them that nothing happened today. Um, and we had a client that did that and they were paying us. We said, um, you guys spilled something over there. They said, what? You guys aren't even out on the site. Yeah, I know, but if you guys walk over uh, 56 feet along the line, you guys spilled something. And it wasn't the problem we were looking at, it just detected it with the system. And they came out there and they said, we did spill something. <laughs> and it's, it's like a lie detector. It's like, yeah, so detecting nothing is, it's one of the strengths of it that people don't really understand is that if you want nothing to happen, that's sometimes a really good thing for a company to know is that nothing is happening. So if you don't want the contaminants to keep moving off the site and you need to prove it to somebody, you could poke a bunch of holes or you could keep taking pictures and saying, trust us, it's not crossed this boundary yet, nothing's happening. That comes in handy. So there's, uh, let's, let's narrow it down to two. There's ones that show up in the picture. So really salty things or, uh, large quantities of Napa and large quantities above part per million. And they say, well, but I want to see uh, 100 parts per billion of trimethyl death. I've got a really nasty contaminant. I don't have a lot of it, but I'm, I'm 20 times the level. It's supposed to be at five PPB, but I'm at 100. I need to track that. I'm not going to be seeing that stuff in the picture. And if you only have that, I'm going to be showing you pictures of the geology and you're going to be picking out channels or fractures and being able to sort out your hydrogeology that way. Um, for a lot of trimethyl death type plumes, there's other stuff in the chemistry. And so you find out that, oh, it's actually pretty conductive where that stuff is at. And we then track a conductor or something like that through there. But um, so it's, it's not necessarily a direct detect of all kinds of things, but it can do all kinds of geology and hydrogeology. So you just apply that. Once you lose signal to contaminant, use that to sort out your hydrogeology and look for your pathways. There, there are, it, it, it's very funny is that it's a, a very personal thing. So um, we've been at consultants and I, I was talking to the VP and she was in charge and we're given our little spiel of what we do. And she's like, has anybody in our company ever done this? And her cubicle was literally right next to one of our former clients. And we're like, Bob used us. And Bob's like, oh yeah, we're great. And she had no idea. And it just didn't transfer. So we get regulators that are like, we love doing this. And then the regulator's like, why do you do it? It's like, because it solves the problem. Um, but it solves the problem in a different way. So in Brave New World stuff, if they don't know how to conceptualize what is my next step and what do I tell the consultant to do, they get, it gets tricky. So like Oklahoma, we built it here with the Oklahoma Corporation Commission. And then they're like, change people and like, I don't know why we would do this. And they stopped using us. And then they got stuck on projects and they're like, hey, is there like a technology out there to help this? Yeah, you guys helped develop it. It's, it's here in Oklahoma. Oh, let's try that. So we're now working for them again. But it's, it seems to be very individual and not organizational. Um, yeah. It's better now that we have increased opportunity control and we have more process things like deep learning and AI. Is that going to change it? So uh, we're, we're working on that now on the academic side. And it's okay. Uh, you've stared at pictures for 20 years. You've stared at thousands and thousands of them. And you've always been curious about that funny wiggle and that funny wiggle, but will the AI go like, actually that funny wiggles in this one and this one too, you just didn't notice. Um, and so teaching the AI to come up and say, I think these spots are your interesting ones. Um, it'll move the ball faster. Um, 
but that's where the standardizing how you collect data to be able to integrate it. Um, no matter which 3D person you talk to, all of them will tell you you burn a huge amount of clock taking people's data sets and making them into something that a 3D can absorb. Um, because, oh, uh, yeah, it's well five. Where is well five? Uh, we've got coordinates for well two. Yeah, great. I need, I need it for all the wells. Um, and so it's working out the protocols and you don't walk into a project where, well, actually we're starting to, we're starting to walk into projects where they know where all their stuff is at and they know where their well screens are at in 3D space. Um, so we're starting to walk into more projects like that, but for their first decade, it was, we'll survey the wells when we're out there because you have no idea where stuff's at other than on this drawn, hand-drawn map of there's a well behind the gas station, there's a well in front of the gas station, there's a well next to the tanks. Great. I can't put that in 3D. Um, so getting getting all the students to go, what do you mean we're not collecting in 3D? What do you mean we're not doing coordinates on this? What do you mean you don't know what the datum is? As that generation comes in saying, what are you guys incompetent? And the older generation that goes, well, this is what we've always done it. Um, I'm seeing a really slow turn in the boat where more of our clients may have a 3D. It's maybe one in 10, one in 20 kind of range. Well, that's not very many. It used to be zero. So we're now got some clients already have a 3D of their site. And then getting a good Excel sheet or a sheet of data that says where stuff is at is also a good, I, I put it up to a good 18.6% of our clients have something like that where the data is actually, you can suck it into a 3D and put it somewhere and you can put it onto a chart. So as, as things get programmed up, the nice thing about this is um, as you're monitoring electrically, you can start telling the computer, do this step for me, do this step for me, do this step for me. And you can keep programming. We've been programming for 20 years and we've gotten more and more automated. And so we can do things now we couldn't have done because it burned too much clock in the good old days. But then as the AI comes in and starts, you probably want to look at this figure and you're like, really, why? And, and the AI says, well, look at that wiggle. It's the same as these other four sites. Um, that stuff will start to really help because it'll, people don't want to pay for that clock, right? So as you can reduce that with new tools, um, that'll be coming along. So I, I expect people to be well-employed doing this kind of work. And AI is going to be a help, like a spreadsheet. Um, I don't see AI solving the projects. Um, Zoom would like to know when you have a bubble of low resistance in your mapped figures, how do you tell the difference between water and active microbes since the active microbes increase electrical conductivity and both would show up as low resistance? So um, most of my water is, uh, most of my sites are saturated. So if I got contaminants in groundwater, my sites are saturated anyway. So my water is everywhere. Um, my microbes tend to do a couple of things. If you're a fuel microbe, you tend to be uh, about three ohmmeters. And that's, that's a range from like one up to 10 with lots of things in like three to five ohmmeter range. That's sort of what that growth looks like. Um, if I go to a Dean Apple site and I've got chlorinated guys, dehalogenators, and they're happy, which it's hard to make a dehalogenator happy. They're cranky guys. But if they're happy, um, they'll go to like a tenth of an ohmmeter, which is you need to have a salt spill to get that to show up. Now, on a microbial basis, I've had microbiologists go, actually, they can't be that conductive. Like, why? They said, no body part that they have is that conductive. Uh, they're not, they're built out of the same thing as a fuel degrader. Their body isn't any different. But they're doing something different. And so uh, there's one group that thinks that they're actually building some sort of a metals deposit. There's other folks that they say actually a bacteria exists called a cable bacteria. And they build instead of one wire to the next guy, they'll build a transmission cable. Um, and so we're looking at things in the subsurface in life that when I asked the microbiologists originally, I thought they were going to give me answers. They don't work on life on the scale of an, a colony. They sample a colony and they know what guys are in this spot. They know what guys are in this spot. And you're like, yeah, why did these guys do this thing? 
And why they send this route down here? And I can see these conductive roots coming off of contaminated sites. And I've given talks to microbiologists where I show all the cool life shapes down there and all the cool things they're doing. And they're like, I'm like, yeah, what are they, what are they thinking? What are they doing? They're like, we've never had access to data sets like this. We have no idea what they're doing, but this is really cool. So there's there's a whole bunch of research that this is generating of yeah, why is that happening on the ground with things that you can never see with a well. So um, the microbial colonies, they kind of look like a tree. And so you'll have gasoline there and they'll grow around it. And then they put down these roots and then they send out stuff over there. And some people think they're trying to dump off electrons and they're doing different stuff and they need some nutrients and they found some nutrients in a couple layers down. So they send a root down to get, hey, I need some vitamin B12 and there's some down there. They pull it up into the colony. Um, and other people are like, they absolutely can't do that. <laughs> um, so it's fun to sit with multiple microbiologists because they do not agree about what the microbes are doing and they have no data to, to debate the other person who thinks they know what they're seeing. So it's really quite entertaining to put two microbiologists in a jar and shake it and watch them fight. So. We do, and, and so like um, we've got a site in Oklahoma City where they sucked out all the sulfate. And so the middle of the fuel site is resistors and the microbes are really struggling in there because there's no electron acceptors and there's um, it's it's pretty hard to live in there. And then in the up gradient part, super conductive, they're happy. And then uh, in the down gradient part, they're growing again. And then there's some methane bubbles that are coming off from the methanogens. Um, so you, you start to see these colony scale on the scale of football fields, life growing and, and dealing with something. Um, and so I had a I had a guy working at a refinery over in Pennsylvania, and we targeted uh, a big resistor. I'm like I think it's probably a methane bubble, but they said, "Well, we did have some solvents used out here." I'm like, mm. "Then you're gonna have to biopsy that." And he's like, "Okay." So he's ready for whichever way it is. This could maybe be a gas bubble. It can maybe be um, some really nasty solvents. Biopsied it, and he said. My PID, photoionization detector, I don't see any gasoline. I don't have any sweet smell like solvents. Should I even sample this spot? I'm like, definitely sample that spot. He's like, okay. Tried to fill the container. And if you've ever practiced this, you put the water in the container, you got to get the cap on with no air in it. And, and you got to practice that. And it's not easy. I suck at it because I don't do it every day. But very experienced. Okay, I got my thing filled. It's got gas in it. I didn't do that right. About the fourth time he figures out it's not me. And he finally gets it full, caps it off fast. It goes about a third gas and all this bioproduct starts growing out of it. And it, he says, I make beer. It looks like my beer. Um, and he basically hit the center of a big colony that was really, really active and, and was sampling. They were just producing so much gas that it was holding as a bubble because it was so active um but you know if you were sampling with a well you would have said oh nothing there to sample pids are clean we're not even going to take a water here this isn't interesting at all um, but the picture says take the sample we had um people below the water table in a clay and we were hitting bubbles and they're like ah it's just dry you're below the water table yeah why is it dry? Um, and so we're, we've we've really opened up a lot of things about groundwater gases that we had no way to know about before. It'd be somebody on a log saying soil was dry, but now we can see the bubbles. And so we can think about what the microbes are doing and where their byproducts are ending up. <laughs>